author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can prove the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Some of you are relieved. Uh, no, I, I've enjoyed this study in the book of James and uh, uh, eight weeks of life hacks. We've taken a long time in the summer teaching series, but uh, uh, life hacks for tough times and rough relationships. And I think that was because uh, James, James sort of helped us feel this out because James, he grew up with Jesus. And if there's anybody, if you're not even a believer, can you imagine being a non-believer and your brother is Jesus? I mean, that would be awkward, wouldn't it? Are you guys there today? Okay. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, I'm here. Come on, do it with some, uh, some oomph today. Come on. I want to hear it. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here too. Um, you guys sound excited. Hey, James, can you imagine this though? James, man, he had it rough because he didn't believe in Jesus the whole time growing up. for thir Jesus, 33 years here on this planet. James, I don't know how much younger James was than Jesus, but whatever time he was with Jesus, he didn't believe until Jesus died and rose again. And when he rose again, then he changed everything. And that's where James is getting this now. And so that's why James can write with confidence this letter that really helps us understand how to deal with these tough times and rough relationships. And, and what we know We've been on the study, and we started out with things like trials, and we've talked about temptations and favoritism. We've talked about wisdom from above, wisdom from below. We've talked about the tongue and all these different practical things that really deal with our everyday life. But James, as we wrap up in week eight, James is weaving this all together. And in fact, it's been throughout the whole letter. He's weaving this one theme that we have to see that stands out to us. It's this theme that we're going to talk about today, and it's the word prayer. <laughs> yeah, I got the idea here. Um, the, the idea, uh, and when you talk about this, the whole thing about prayer, um, what you have to understand is when I said prayer, a lot of you are like, oh, no, it's going to be one of those. It's guilt. He's going to lay it on us that we didn't pray enough and all that kind of stuff. It's sort of like when you go to the dentist, and the dentist asks you, like, have you been flossing? Everybody knows they're supposed to, but nobody wants to admit they don't do it. And that's how it is in church, right? It's like prayers, like when we start talking about that, like, oh, no, it's like flossing. Everybody knows we're supposed to pray all the time, but it's not easy. It's not something I like to do all the time. And that's really where we get into this tough situation. See, James here, uh, he, he, he's, he's going to weave this through. In fact, if you remember back in James chapter 1, he started with that whole, uh, hey, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask prayer. 
That's what he's talking about. And it's woven all the way through. Because remember, James, he had all these subjects, but they sort of collide into each other because they're all about life and wisdom and how we work with God. And prayer is really the subject we're going to talk about today. And, and, and I think a lot of people, we lack excitement when it comes to prayer uh, or we feel guilty for not praying enough. And, and, and some of it's because, to be honest with you, when we go through bad situations, and I know this is going to sound really bad, but some of us, we sit back and we're like, I'm not even sure there is a God. And we start doubting. And, and, and remember, we've always said it's okay to doubt, but James wants to help us with that. Because remember, James was an original doubter. He grew up in a family. He doubted Jesus all the way until Jesus died. That was pretty much a lot of doubt. And James here, uh, he would tell you, hey, I, there were times when he doubted too. He doubted the whole issue of who Jesus was. And a lot of us, sometimes we go through cir- circumstances. Uh, obviously, the circumstances that, that we've talked about already today is the circumstances of David Boone passing with us last week. And that's just so tough because when you see a good man, a, a, a good honorable guy who's, who's been so faithful to his wife and his family and his church and the friends he has that it packs out a, a, an auditorium at a church for a funeral, and you're wondering, like, why? Why would this happen? If there was really a God, would he let this happen? And questions like that come up, and we don't like to talk about them, but it also keeps us from actually believing that God's going to do anything about it. Because some of us, we sat back and said, well, I pray for David all the time, but God didn't do anything for him. And those kind of things cause us to doubt if God really exists. And, and, and a lot of it actually is because so many people doubt there's a God, they don't want to pray to him because they're not really sure that he's a good father because they haven't had a good father. I don't know if you're in that category or not today, but that's one of those things I don't really get through. But, but when you go through the Bible, and, and we've, we've read through in, in our uh, devotional times, our personal times, and our Bible studies here at the church, in Sunday school classes, preaching in different various uh, aspects every week, we read through all kinds of people who they believed in prayer in the Bible. It's not hard to find that, right? I mean, you go starting in the very beginning of the Bible all the way through, you can find people who prayed. Um, there are p- prayers. Moses prayed. Uh, he had to pray. He was leading over a million people who were really obstinate and complained all the time. That's uh, what it's like to be a pastor sometimes. It's just hard. And so Moses found himself praying a lot to God. In fact, he interceded for people that I wouldn't necessarily always do. David prayed. David was a man after God's own heart. But David did the incredible things that he did because he prayed. But we find people uh, all the way through. Esther, when Esther was faced with a national crisis, uh, crisis where her people, the Israelites, were going to be executed. The first thing she does is she tells everybody, hey, I'm going to pray, so please pray and fast with me. That's what she asked to do. And of course... Probably the biggest model in the Bible of prayer would be found in the New Testament. There's this guy named Jesus. And you're sitting back going, what? Jesus prayed? Absolutely. In fact, Jesus was the epitome of the prayer life that we should have. Jesus thought it was so important to pray that so often his disciples would be looking for him and find like, well, Jesus got up early this morning and prayed. In fact, that may be one of those things like we were talking about this morning, um, men's breakfast. You know, we have to get up early for that breakfast. It was a good breakfast, but we have to get up early. And, man, sometimes I, I told the guys this morning, I said, I think there are two kinds of people in life. Those people who love to get up early and then the people who hate those people. <laughs> and I'm probably in the group, too, there, although I have to get up early a lot of times. But, you know, honestly, if you're one of those people who likes to get up at crazy hours of the, time, uh, of the night because, because you like to, not because you couldn't sleep, but because you like to, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but, um, and, 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 and those are the people who always lay the guilt traps on us because we didn't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to pray like they do. But you know what? Jesus, Jesus, we find him so often, he gets up early and prays. Uh, I think about uh, there was this time when he, he got up real early. The Bible says before the day broke, and usually when they refer to that, that time period is around 4 o'clock in the morning. Jesus got up to pray. Because you know how it is when, when everybody gets up, it's just noisy. At least it is my house, and there's just me and my wife, you know. Um, it's just noisy, and I like to have a little quiet time. I like to have that peace that I can think and concentrate. And, and Jesus got up because those disciples, they were just loud and needy. And Jesus got up, and the next thing you know, in the Bible, we read that, hey, Peter's running around going, Jesus, Jesus, where were you? We were looking for you all over the place. We tried everything to get a hold. Don't you know everybody's looking for you? The big exaggerator, Peter. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, I'm right here. Um, I was praying. I was praying, but let's go ahead. We've got a lot of things to do today. And that's what I was praying about. And they go off and they have a full day. 
We find another time when Jesus, he's coming off one of the worst days of his life. He finds out John the Baptist had lost his head, and, and he's gone. And, and the crowd's needy, and the crowd comes and says, feed us, feed us, feed us. And so he feeds them, 5,000 of them, out of a uh, small boy's lunch, snack, really. And, and, <laughs> and he's tired, and he still wants to have his prayer time. So he puts the disciples in a boat, because he knew he'd get away with, from them if he put them in a boat. Puts them on the boat, pushes them out, and says, see you on the other side, boys. And he hides from the crowds, goes up into the mountain, and he's in a solitary place. And there he communes with God until about 3 a.m. in the morning when he comes walking on the water to the disciples who are in the midst of this boat uh, scene. And that's when you see the whole stormy situation, Peter walking on water, everything goes a little crazy there. And, but it was all about prayer. It really was. And, and what we find out here when we talk, think about this is, is that Jesus had a need, and get this, Jesus had a need and a passion for uh, a conversation with God. Jesus had a need and a passion for, and, and that stuck out. Because here's another thing I want you to think about as we're talking about this prayer. You know, the disciples, the disciples only asked Jesus one thing to ever be taught. Now, <laughs> as I'm thinking about it, I was thinking like, you know, some of the things that if I had been one of the disciples, maybe I'd have been like, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to multiply fish and bread? Because that would be really handy, wouldn't it? I mean, you've, you've done it. He did it more than once. Jesus, could you teach us that? They didn't ask that. Hey, hey, Jesus, how about, you know what would be a really cool trick? Teach us all how to walk on water. Because, man, that would get the crowds, wouldn't it? That would build a huge crowd. They didn't ask that either. Hey, hey, Jesus, could you teach us how to do, and you can name any one of the miracles, they would have been pretty cool to do. Turn water into wine. Let's get them all drunk. Hey, Jesus, could you... Heal, teach us how to heal people. All the, and you know what? They never asked that. They never asked that. They never asked for any of the supernatural powers of God. You know what they said? After watching Jesus and his life story and how he talked with God, the Bible says that they came to Jesus one time and they said, Jesus, Jesus teach us. Lord, teach us how to pray. And you remember that because Jesus starts it off and he said, Our Father who art in heaven. But he started off with that, our Father. And, and, and I think that's so important because Jesus had this need, and it's, it, it, what we understand here is what Jesus is saying when he says, our Father, which art in heaven. He, you know, he starts that off because he wants us to understand it is our Father, and there is a connection for it. Because it's hard to pray if we don't understand that God is a perfect Father who is present with us and wants to spend time with us. And, and, and Jesus says, hey, our Father who art in heaven, and we, he wants us to understand that. See, your prayer life is connected to who you believe God is. And a lack of prayer life is also connected to who you believe God is, too. And I know that, that, that cringes on that guilt thing, but we're not trying to think about that. I love Louis Giglio. He's just a real plain and simple guy. And he's a, he's a preacher, if you don't know, grew up with Andy Stanley. and some of the, he, he runs the Passion Ministries. Um, he's reached more young people for Jesus in this generation than any other guy. He's amazing what he does, runs these huge events. He said this about God. He said, God is not a reflection of your earthly father because he understands what, what Louis Giglio's understanding is that sometimes our earthly fathers are not what they ought to be. He says, God's not a reflection of your earthly father. He's the perfection of all that we long for in a dad. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Think about what he's saying there. And, and God is not a reflection of this a simple man. It's actually simple men. We're more a, a little bit of a reflection of him. But he is the perfection of all that we long for. And that's what, that's what makes God so great. And that's why Jesus is saying, hey, our father who art in heaven, that's where we start with. See, what's great about God is he's never too busy for you. He's never preoccupied. He doesn't have bad mood swings. In fact, we already studied this, but back in James, in chapter number one of James, where we started off in our series, he said, every good, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. He's such a good father. That's where the good stuff comes. And so as we look at this today, uh, we're going to be in the book of James, chapter number 5, but as we look at this, I want to give you one thing you need to know, two things you need to do, and then we're going to get into life hacks. And, and it's sort of weird because our life hacks are actually going to be where we're going to look into our scripture. So hang in there with me because I'm setting the stage for what we're talking about here. One thing you need to know, 
And this is a simple working definition of prayer that you may have never thought about it, but this is how, how James would tell us about it. This is what the Bible really teaches. Prayer is keeping company with God. That's what prayer is. See, we have all these fancy definitions that make it so hard, but the truth of the matter is, if we understand this, we know this, we'll, we'll be able to practice this a lot, whole lot better. Prayer is keeping company with God. And that's a simple definition, and, and, and it's easy to do because we just talked about who God is. And, and when we talk about these things, we've said, hey, number one, it, it's, 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 it's just having a simple conversation with God, but keeping God in the loop with us, too. And so the two things you need to do, number one, talk with God every day because he enjoys your company. <laughs> and he might be the only one every day. I'm serious. I mean... <laughs> Let's not be, let's not be too, too bold about ourselves. It's not because we're so great that he enjoys us. He delights in us because he made us. He delights in us because he's redeemed us. And that is prayer. By the way, in order to be a, an effective communicator with God, through prayer, you have to be a child of God. You have to be a child of God. See, God does hear the sinner, sinner's prayer, but it's a prayer for mercy and repentance. That's what the prayer is. But the rest of them, his ears are open to those who are right with him. His ears are open to his children. The righteous, that's who he's seeking every day. And so what God wants, number one, we should understand this, he wants to talk with us every day because he enjoys our company. And that's the amazing thing about God. When others don't. See, I already told you, God's not an iffy God. We're not supposed to uh, uh, be thinking about it. God enjoys your company. You don't bore God. You don't bother him. God enjoys you, and he desires you. And we know this because as a father, he approves of us. He loves us. We know that he blesses us as a father, and it brings joy to our hearts because we weren't made to live without our father's approval. That's what's so important with that. Every day, every day, he enjoys our company. That's what he wants us to understand. We weren't made to live without our father's approval, and yet we often seek other people's approval instead of God's. See, this is not because God loves us because of us. Really, God loves us because of Jesus. See, it's the righteousness of Jesus that's covered us, and that's why we're good with God in this area of, of him loving us. See, the Father loves you as he loves God the Son. Have you ever thought about that? The Father loves you as, God, uh, as he loves God the Son, which means that there is nobody that God loves more than you. There is nobody. And yet it's not because of you, really. It's because of Jesus. That's the whole idea. The second truth that we're supposed to, to do is talk with God about everything because he cares about you. Talk with God about everything because he cares about you. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous, uh, famous scholar and, and expositor of God's word, he, he wrote this, and I didn't put this on the screen, but he wrote this. He says, it is not in his character, that is God's character, to be unconcerned for you, the one who paid the greatest price for you cares for every little detail of your life. Did you, let me say it again. The one who paid the greatest price for you cares for every little detail of your life. Let me whittle that down to one little sentence. It's this. If it matters to you, it matters to God. <laughs> Maybe you've never thought about that before. That's what's great about prayer. God says, hey, bring it to me because if it matters to you, it matters to God. It matters to me, and that's the whole I think. See, everything in your life, everything in my life matters to God. Now, there is no detail too small. I had, I had a student one time I was talking to about this years ago, and that student said, you mean God cares about what's in my lunchbox? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Really? I don't believe that. And I said, there is nothing too small. Now, I said, here's the thing we have to understand. <laughs> it may not matter as much to God as it does to you. That sandwich in, or whatever your lunch is today, for some of you, it really matters to me. Hey, Jay, does your lunch matter to you? It matters to me, right? It matters to me, but it may not matter quite as much to God on the level of all things. And that's what we have to understand. But it still matters to God, and it is important to him. See, it, it matters to God because God thinks you're important. And, and listen to this. If you trust God with the things that matter to you, guess what? He'll trust you with the things that matter to him. And that's super important. And this is how prayer works. And this is the importance of prayer. Because what we find in prayer is that in prayer, you get perspective in life. 
In prayer, you get perspective in life, and that's really what it's all about. See, often we get this misconception about our lives that, hey, we pray to get what we want from God. That's not, hey, God is not our cosmic genie. God's not in some lamp that we're just rubbing all the time going, hey, I want this, I want this, I want this, change this, do this. And that's why we often get dis- disappointed when God doesn't do what we want. Prayer is supposed to change us so we get a perspective in life. It does. And, that, and that's the whole issue there. See, God, God wants us to understand this perspective. See, prayer can change our perspective on the circumstances, and we look less at ourselves and more to God. That's the whole idea behind prayer. See, I, I think for most of us, um, we've, we've pictured our Christian life like this next picture. It's a picture of a roller coaster. Most of us think of our Christian life as it's got ups and downs or just all, you know, it's not, sometimes it's the hills and valleys. We talk about that. But the roller coaster effect. And, and, and that seems to be so true, but I actually heard it explained a little different with another picture, and it's the next picture, the picture of a train tracks. I think this is more true about what's, what's actually going on in our lives. See, if you look at the train tracks, there are two sides of the train tracks, aren't there? It doesn't just go down and up on one side. It goes at equals. And, and the picture of the train tracks, and this is what you have to understand, I think what God would want us to, to know is that good and bad things happen in our lives all at the same time. You get good with the bad. It's not an uphill, downhill thing. They come at the same time. See, yesterday we were rejoicing that David had been translated to the kingdom of God because he had been suffering with Parkinson's disease. He'd been suffering in a frail body. But the downside, the bad side, is that we also are bereaved because he's gone. And we miss him. We miss his, his uh, enthusiasm for life. We miss his encouragement. We miss what he would do to make us feel better and encouragement we need. And so life isn't two separate things where you have hills and valleys. It really is about train tracks. You have good and bad. And how we respond to them is so important, and that's how prayer works for us. See, when we pray in bad circumstances, when we pray in the bad situations of life, God changes our perspective and gives us hope. That's in the bad circumstances. Hey, when we pray in the good circumstances of life, because you get good and bad at the same time, God helps us become more humble, and it does humble us. But when we fail to pray under bad circumstances, it fills us up with self-pity. We have our big pity parties for us. And when we fail to pray in good times, you know what it does to us? It makes us prideful and selfish. See, prayer helps us focus on God, not on the good or the bad. See, you can focus on your problems or you can focus on your pleasures, but the way, the way to find your purpose is to focus on God in prayer. And that's what the importance of prayer. Now, I said all that is basically an introduction. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of James, chapter number five. James has written a lot of stuff, and we've already covered a lot of it, but here, let me give you this. James chapter 5, beginning verse 13, James is going to tell us some things that are so important. So read with, with me, beginning verse 13, we're going to read all the way through verse 18. He says, is anyone, blanket statement, that's good because anyone's you and me, is anyone among you in trouble? First category, trouble. Isn't that what we're talking about? Tough times, rough relationships? We can just say trouble, right? In fact, uh, one, of, one of Job's friends said this, he said, man is born into trouble. You just, thought, you just thought you ended up in trouble all the time? Maybe your mom or dad told you you're always in trouble? No, you were born for trouble. That's, that's how we are. We come into this world looking for that. James says, is anyone in trouble? Obviously, yes. He says, let them. What? Pray. What was that? Pray. Pray. Not figure it out on our own, not solve the problems, not do all these hysteric things, go into dramatic situations where we're supposed to do. Pray. Pray. Hmm. He says, if you're in trouble, pray. Then he goes the opposite direction because remember, train tracks, good and bad come at the same time, don't they? So he says, just in case you thought it was just all bad, let me give you the good side. If anyone's happy, what are you supposed to do? Let them sing songs of praise. And you know, praise and prayer are about the same thing. In fact, you never find them really separated because with the same mouth, you pray and you praise. In fact, praise is actually a type of prayer. If you didn't know that, read through the book of Psalms, and those are praises, praise hymns to God that are actually prayers, national prayers. Verse 14, he goes on to say, is anyone among you sick? Now, when he talks about the sickness, just, just for full disclosure here, he's not necessarily just talking about physical sickness. 
He's actually including major spiritual sickness in this. And this, he's given us a solution for this. But he says, is any among you sick? And of course, the answer would always be yes. He says, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. Now, why the elders? Because the elders are the representatives of God's people. That's what he's saying. Get godly people around you. And, and he says, call the elders of the church to pray over them. Then he goes on to say, and anoint them. And, and I tell you, every time I'm around people who've read this verse, they, they focus only on this phrase here. And anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. I mean, they break out the kitchen oil, they break out every kind of oil, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to know, there's nothing supernatural about this oil he's talking about here. Oil in this time period was how they got medicine to you. If you read through the story of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, he bound up the, the, the man who was beaten and left for dead. He binds up the wounds and pours oil on them. Yeah, because it was medicinal. That was most of the medicines of that day. So he's, he's not really saying, hey, do something crazy, something charismatic, something wild here, pour oil. It's not special oil. Um, of course, people are always like, well, the oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it is. But he's going to deal with that in just a second. He's talking about, hey, pray first, doctor second. Pray first, doctor second. He goes on, verse 15, he says, and the prayer, he didn't say in the oil, notice what he said, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. Isn't that great? He's not talking about the medicine, he's talking about God, and yes, we believe that God is the great healer. He is the balm of Gilead. That's the whole idea. And so this is, this is guaranteeing it, but it comes through prayer because you have to ask God for these things. And he goes on to say, if they have sinned, remember we said that the sickness isn't necessarily just physical sickness, it's spiritual sickness. He says if they've sinned, if they've asked God, they've prayed, they've done everything they sh they're supposed to do, they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Isn't that great to know that we have a God who, when you fall down, he lifts you up. He doesn't kick you in the dirt. He doesn't spit on you. He doesn't walk away from you because you weren't perfect. He says, when you come back to me, when you repent, when you've realized you've sinned and you've prayed about it, that prayer of faith and the God's healing effect is going to cause me to forgive you for your sin. In verse 16, he says, therefore, wrap it up. That's a summary statement. Confess your sins to each other and Pray for each other. Wow, that's the whole thing. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you know why Christians are so, so hurt and broken today in their churches? Because no one's praying for each other. We're praying for our want list, our wish list. It's like, I remember when I was a kid, we used to get the Sears wish book. Anybody ever remember those? I love that time of year. There were, actually there was two um, catalogs that came out, the Sears wish book and there was, a, there was a store called Best, and I don't know if you, you guys remember Best or you had them around here, but they were a catalog-type store, and they had just cool things in them. And they, only, they sent out their little wish catalog. But I'd take those two, and I'd sit down, and I'd make, man, I'm looking through. I never, never really gotten any of those things out of those catalogs, but I just looked at them like, man, they were the greatest things. <laughs> and I think that's the whole idea here. It's our wish list, and sometimes we pray like that. God, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me a, a, a new car. A new house, new wife, new kids, new, new job, God. And, and when he doesn't, we start doubting his existence. And James says, no, 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 that's not the purpose of prayer. Let me get back to it. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Because you know what happens? He's picturing this group of Christians who've gotten together. And why do they have to confess their sins? Because they've sinned against God and each other. And what happens when people sin against each other? You know what we do? We get bitter. We get mad. We get upset. We're not, we stop talking to each other. We go, nope, I'm not doing it. And he says, don't do that. Confess your sins. You know what? Confession is good for the soul. And you ever heard that statement? What he's saying is be honest, be transparent. Go to the other person and say, hey, you know what? I messed up. Confess to each other. And, and pray for one another. And then he makes this statement that is so profound here because this is so, so bottom line to it. He says, the prayer, the prayer. Notice the only action he says. It's the prayer of a righteous man. He didn't talk about doing all these extra things. He didn't say the Bible study. He didn't say, hey, the baptism. He didn't say all these other things. He said, the prayer. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And just in case we miss what he's saying here, he says, let me give you an illustration. He goes on, verse 17, says, Elijah. 
he makes a profound statement here. Elijah was a human being. Why would he say that? Of course he was a human being. No, no, no. In, in Israel, in their day, Elijah was one of the great prophets. In fact, there are statues. You go to the Holy Land, there are actually statues of Elijah. He's revered as one of the greatest of all the prophets. Stood against Ahab in one of the darkest time periods of their country. Elijah was a man who did great wonders, and he was profound. In fact, he was just supernaturally revered. People were scared to death of Elijah and what he would do with God's power. But here, James wants to make sure we understand Elijah wasn't anything. He was just like you and me. That's what he's saying here. He says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. (laughs) He was just like you. He had every weakness, every sinful tendency, every anger, every emotion. He treated people poorly. He didn't honor God the way he spoke. He was just like you and me. But here's what he did. And this is the power of it. Remember that, that the prayer of a righteous man. That's what he's saying. He said he prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And you know what happened? <laughs> and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Three and a half years. Three and a half year drought. Everybody was upset with that one. And just to make sure you understand how his prayer was working, he goes on in verse 18. He says, and again he prayed, and the heavens got rain. They gave rain, and the earth produces crops, and everything was back to normal. And we realize when he says all that, that was prayer was just another perspective on his life. He didn't have any power because actually it was God's power. And that's what you study when you study, the book of, uh, when you study through the life of Elijah. You find that he had that. And so today, I've talked about the importance of prayer, and, and my, my goal today, before we get any farther down the road, my goal, I should have started this off at the beginning of this, my goal today is to encourage you to pray. Maybe some of you, you've, you've been doubting prayer. Maybe you haven't prayed the way you need to. Maybe you, you learned all the, you know, rub dub dub thank you for my grub kind of prayers as a kid, and that's all you know how to do. Hey, prayer is just a conversation with God. It's, it's contacting with God. It's communing with God on a day-to-day basis. So let me give you three life hacks. First thing I want you to do is um, if you have a cell phone, I know we never ask you to do this, but if you have a cell phone, I don't have, mine actually is recording right now, the live recording in the back, so I don't have mine on me. If you have a cell phone, go ahead and take it out because your first life hack to help you learn how to pray better is found on your phone. I'm going to show you something that's so amazing. In fact, uh, I'm going to need to borrow somebody's phone. Can I borrow your phone? What's the password? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, actually, I do want you to turn it on. I won't do anything weird to you. Watch it. I want to show you something that's going to help your prayer life a whole lot. <clears throat> there is an app built into it. Everybody get the phone. Hold your phone up, man. Be proud. You guys are always on them. Okay, hold them up. Now, if you didn't have your stay, you can do this later. But everybody get the phone? Okay. There is an app on your phone that will help you pray better. Every phone, I don't care if you have an old ancient flip phone or not, has one of these. Okay? On this one, it's on the side, and it's called the power off button. It is. You see, the first hack there is to power down to power up, and that's the truth. Power down to power up. You know, we live in a culture where Hey, you know what? We don't have time for God, but we have time for Facebook, for Instagram, for Snapchat, for TikTok, for, I don't know, whatever it's goofy names they can come up with. X, I think is what he calls it now. All these different things. But you know what? It robs us of our time with God. And for all the people who are like, I don't, just have, I don't have time to sit around and pray. You have time to do everything else. Good grief. I, I don't know, some of you guys just turned that off like I did, but, you know, I used to feel convicted when I got my phone, and, you know, there's an, there's a, they have an app that actually counts how much time you spend on your phone, and the first thing I did was turn that thing off because it kept telling me. And when I realized, like, wow, I'm on that thing way more than I need to be, that's embarrassing. And you know what, if we're going to be good prayers, if we're going to learn how to commune with God, if we're going to be good people about praying, we need to realize we have to power down and power up. Verse 13, go back to what he said. Hey, you know what he said? If you're in trouble or if you are happy, then we need to do what? Pray. He didn't say get out your phone, get out of this distraction. He said be solely focused on this. We need to power down to power up. 
That's the whole idea there. He said, you know, it, it's so hard to pray. And let me just give you a couple of, like, just basic things before we move on to the next one. Um, let's, let's, let's just think about this. How do I power down to power up? Well, for those of you that might struggle a little bit, hey, you know what? Get in a quiet place. Turn everything off. Get the distractions away from you. Hey, ADD, ADHD runs rampant in our society now. The attention span of most young people is less than eight seconds less than eight seconds before they have to go on to the next thing. That's harsh. It really is. And you know what we need to do is eliminate those distractions and then maybe sit down. I would encourage you this. One of the things I found helpful in developing a prayer life, write out some prayers. Now, I'm not good at that, but write out some prayers. In fact, you can always go to the Bible and find some of the prayers that people who are great people, of men and women of God, prayed. Write those down and pray those prayers as you're doing the other thing I would tell you in, in this whole help yourself be better at prayer, it goes with football season. Now, if you're not a big football fan, this won't make any sense to you, but it's what I call first and ten. First and ten. That's how you think of it in football. Football, the first thing you do when you're having a hard time praying, sit down with a piece of paper and write down the numbers one through ten, and then write down ten things you're thankful for and pray those ten things to God. This is an awesome thing. It's an easy thing. Hey, we just need to have that conversation. Hey, so many people are so worried about, I didn't pray for 30 minutes. Hey, God never said there's a certain amount of time you have to pray. But he said, God, he said men ought always to pray and not to faint. He did say that. And I think that's one of the problems. We need to power down so we can power up. Number two is we need to get the right focus. Get the right focus. Um, he says in verses 14 and 15, we've read these already, but he says, if any of you are sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray for them. And then he says, and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse, 16, uh, verse 15, he says, and the prayer of faith will make the, uh, the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. And you know what he's talking about here? He's talking about that right focus. So many times I've talked about this, uh, the, the sickness that we have in our life is not the, the physical sickness. He's not talking about COVID or cancer and all those things. He's talking about the spiritual sickness in our life. Because it's that spiritual sickness that keeps us from focusing on God. He's saying, you know what? We need to get that sin out of our life. We need to look at it in a different way. He says, you know what? If you're sick, you need to pray. And it's a prayer of repentance, that prayer of confession. We need to get ourselves to the point where we have the right focus. Because so often we, we don't do that right. See, having, having other people around us, that's what he tell, tells Invite godly people around you. He says, call for the elders of the church, and that's what he's representing there. Call for some godly people to come in and pray with you. Help yourself by surrounding yourself with the right people. And, and he says, hey, you know what? When you do this, you're helping yourself because you're bringing a sense of God's presence to yourself. It works, too. Because it takes, it takes a lot of courage to ask for help. That's why so many of us don't like to do that. You know, I think about this in this aspect. We look in the Old Testament, a guy named Job, and you know the story of Job. He lost everything, lost his kids, his wealth, his health, all these different things. And his wife, her encouragement was, go curse God and die. What a, what a great wife. But the Bible says at the end of all this, and I love this verse. If you've never read this, Job 42.10, it says that after Job had prayed for his friends, not for himself, not for his misfortune, not for, oh, I need all this stuff back in my life. It says, after he prayed for his friends, because his friends were a little bit, uh, they were off in the head. They kept blaming him for everything. Job, Job sat back after arguing with his friends and realizing who God was. He said, I need to pray for my friends. After Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored Job's fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm not, this is not prosperity gospel, so if you pray, it doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery or anything. In fact, don't be playing the lottery, but um, that's not what it means there. What it means is if you want to have an effective prayer life, stop putting yourself at the center. Look for other people's how you can help them. And that's what, Job is try, or that's what James is trying to help us with. Um, often the process of enduring the afflictions of this life, as Job was, our focus becomes self-centered. We, fo we fixate on our needs, our problems, our prayers, our wants. And sometimes the best thing is to shift our attention and think about somebody else. And that's why praying for somebody else helps. Focus on somebody else. Because you have needs in your own life, but when we focus on the needs of others, our perspective changes. Because prayer changes our perspective in life. See, what you keep in your own hands tends to shrink. You don't believe me? Put some money in it for a while and see how it shrinks. 
shrinking every day, isn't it? But what you put in God's hand <laughs> multiplies. That's the whole idea there. Number three, and last of all, I would say this. The third life hack, connect. Connect to the right power supply. Connect to the right power supply. <sighs> so often we're plugged into the wrong source, and that's so harsh. Verse number 16, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And you know what he's telling us there? <laughs> he's telling us to plug in to the source of our life. And that one source in our life is so important. It's the right energy source for every believer is that Holy Spirit of God. That's what James would tell us. Plug into the Holy Spirit. Rest in that. You know why Jesus was so effective in his earthly ministry? If you don't know, you have to go back to the very first ministry story that Jesus began Jesus' ministry. It was at the baptism. Jesus comes forward and he has, has John the Baptist baptize him there in the Jordan River. And you probably, it's probably the coolest baptism of all because it came with special effects, right? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because Jesus goes under the water and you hear this booming voice. Probably way better than James Earl Jones, but that's how I always picture it. And he says, this is my beloved son. I can't even imitate the voice, so I won't try. But this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. And, and the people there, what did they see? They saw this dove descending. And not only was God the Father pleased, but God the Holy Spirit was empowering him. And that power came down on him in the shape of that dove that day, and it marked the beginning of his ministry. <laughs> and you know why Jesus could do the miracles he did? You know why he was effective in everything he did? So he was plugged into the right power source. The church, church understood this over in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Jesus had told them this is what's going to happen. He said, you're going to receive power, <laughs> the power source, right? And, and he didn't say just power because you're going to take energy drinks. You're going to drink jolt cola. You're going to drink a lot of Mountain Dew and be high on sugar. No, he said, you're going to receive power to do the purpose of God because you're going to be plugged into the power source, and that power source was the Holy Spirit. It's the power source we all need. See, the Holy Spirit gave that first church meaning by empowering them to fulfill God's purpose. And it was impossible for them to do anything on their own without the Holy Spirit. Think about this. Paul and Silas, they go off to this town of Philippi, and they're arrested and thrown into the deepest part of the, the, the uh, dungeon. And at midnight, and I the Bible doesn't tell us whether they were good at this or not, but they sang, sang praise songs. They prayed and sang praise songs. Isn't that what James just got done telling us? Mm -hmm. If you're sad or you're happy, if you're in trouble or you're in good times, sing praise songs or pray, either one. And they did that, and what happens is there's an earthquake, and we, we know this, that they're loose, their doors open, prisoners are set free, the bonds of their life are, uh, are taken off. Just because of what? Was it their power of song? Did they have supernatural vocal cords? Should they have been in the greatest choir of all time? No. That's not what the, the verse is telling us. It's telling us that the power of the Holy Spirit was what they were plugged into. And when you're plugged into it, God can do amazing things. Whew. That's what happened that day. Plugged into the power source, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was thinking about, once again, when we talk about prayers, I wrap this up today. Prayer is a lot like playing chess which is very difficult. When I was a kid, uh, <clears throat> they sent me off to this advanced school um, when I was in second, third grade. It was called Futura, and uh, you had to, I, I was supposed to be like intelligent or something, I don't know, I think they got that one wrong. But they made us do things that the other kids weren't doing. Um, and some of it was fun, they had us do um, creative things, but one of the things they, they did was they had us play chess, second grade. Now, I grew up in a family where I had older brothers, quite a bit older than me, and uh, my older brothers, they played chess all the time. They played all these really smart, advanced games. They were really smart guys. And uh, in fact, they, had, they didn't have a regular chess board. They had a three-level chess board. And I didn't understand how it worked, all the rules and all that. I, I barely understood how to play checkers at that time, to be honest with you. I was more of a checkers kind of guy. So they sent us off to this club, and then we started uh, this, this special school a couple days a week from our regular school. And it's called Future, and they, they want us to learn how to play chess. And I remember the very first thing they told us, um, they said, the important thing you need to know in chess is that if you lose the king, you lose the game. If you lose the king, you lose the game. That was the bottom line. Years down the road, I, I came across this picture that uh, 
Um, no, let's go back to the picture. Yeah, that's where we want to be here for a while. This picture. No, I didn't draw this picture. That's way more talent than I have. Actually, this is a famous picture. And it has a story that I read, and I don't know if you've ever heard the story. The picture is called Checkmate. And the artist who drew this, if you look at the picture, it depicts this man on the right here in the green with the feather coming out of his cap as actually a depiction of Satan. The other man is a, just a man, and obviously you can see the angel in the background. They're playing chess. And it's called Checkmate. And it's hung in a famous museum over in, in Paris called the Louvre. And it said that the story behind this, and this is such a cool story, that this grand master of chess came through one day just looking at the various paintings. Of course, uh, several important paintings were there. And he came across this one. He stopped for a while. And he was with his friend. And he looked at his friend. And he said, you know, there's something odd about this picture. Something just isn't right. He said, I, I, I'm going to stand here and look at this for a while. So go ahead and, and, and go ahead on without me. Um, come back when you're done. I, I'm going to figure this out. So he stood there and he stood there and he stood there and he looked at this picture for a long time, just analyzing the whole picture. And after about an hour or so, his friend came back and the grand master at chess looked at him and said, we've got to find who the author is, uh, the, the painter. We need to find who he is because he's got it wrong. There's a mistake in this. He said, one of two things needs to happen. Either they need to change the name of the painting, or they need to change the painting. And, and his friend sort of smiled like, well, the guy might not even be alive. And the Grand Master, he looked at him and said, you don't understand. As I sat here and looked at the chess pieces, and I looked at all the things that were on the board, he said, here's what I realized about this. This is what's wrong. He says, as I look at it and contemplate how that they've given this title checkmate because they feel, feel like Satan's won, he said, here's what I can tell you. But the king has got one more move. The king's got one more move. And I want you to know this. When you look in the Bible and you look at Moses as he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they get to the edge of the Red Sea, and the greatest army on earth is chasing behind them. And the Red Sea is in front of them, and they look like they have no hope. Everybody's saying, hey, it's checkmate. There's no more moves. But you know what? The king always has one more move. You know, when a teenage boy runs out to meet a nine and a half foot tall giant named Goliath with just a sling and a stone, everybody sat back and said, oh, he's got swords, he's got shields, he's got armor. He's been trained for all his life on how to do this thing. It's checkmate. This boy is going down. But you know what? The king always has one more move. Daniel was led into a lion's den. And there he was sealed up. And everyone was sure that as the night went on, that it was checkmate for Daniel. That he surely would be food for lions. But I want you to know the king always has one more move. <laughs> Jesus hung on a cross. He hung there. Gave up his life. They took his body down, put it in a tomb, and they sealed it with a Roman seal. And you know what they said? Checkmate. It's over. But I want you to know, the king always has one more move. I don't know what you're going on, going on in your life, but as James would tell you today, as we've talked about trials, we've talked about temptation, we've talked about wisdom, we've talked about prayer, we've talked about all these different things. You know what James would tell you? The most important thing you need to do is connect with God because the king always has one more move. And you don't have to worry about what you're going to do when checkmate seems to be there. You just need to turn to God in prayer. So I would encourage you, if you have been a long time neglecting your prayer life, maybe you've put other things in front of it. Maybe you have got discouraged because you don't feel like your wish list is getting granted. I want you to know the king always has one more move. He's never giving up in your life. So don't give up on the king because he is ultimately going to win. We started off by telling you that prayer only works if you're a child of God you have that relationship. And so, as always, we don't, we don't ever want to bypass this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, if you've never accepted him, if you've never, if you've never humbled yourself, today's the day. I'm not asking if you're a church member, if you've been baptized, if you've given, if you come all the time. 
I'm not asking if you've read your Bible. I'm not asking if you've prayed or done any religious things. I'm asking, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I grew up in the, the son of a pastor. In church all my life. But it wasn't until I reached high school that I actually made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. And it was hard because all the people who were Christians, I felt like, were looking down on me. It was embarrassing. I didn't want to have to walk forward and say, oh, yeah, it's me. It's me. No, I didn't want to do any of that. But that was just really Satan whispering, checkmate. Checkmate. Don't let Satan whisper in your ear today, checkmate. Because the king always has one more move. God gave his life. God gave his only begotten son to die on that cross for you and for me. Don't ignore, don't ignore Jesus Christ. That's the truth. So if you don't know Jesus Christ today, don't walk out of here. Don't walk away from it because you're not guaranteed one more minute. Hey, I'm telling you right now, the most important decision you make is for Jesus Christ. If you're not 100% sure of your salvation, then today's the day. Don't walk away. For most of us, though, this was a series about Christian living. What did you learn? I was reading a book this last week by a guy named Bob Goff. And Bob Goff said, you know what the problem is? He said so many Christians study the, study the Bible and get into Bible studies and they know so many things. But he said, just knowing and not doing, like James says, and he referred to James. He says, you know what that, that is? He says, that's just stalking Jesus. He says, you're a, you're a Jesus stalker. You're not really a disciple. You're not really a follower. You're not a disciple. You're a Jesus stalker. It doesn't, you don't need more information. You need transformation. And until we go ahead and say, you know what? God help me because I'm not praying like I should. God help me. I'm not doing, I've just been creating wish lists, want lists. God help me because I need some help. Until we start acknowledging ourselves before who he is, we're never going to change. So I invite you today not to feel guilty, but to feel <laughs> relieved, to feel empowered. Because there's a God who loves you. There's a God who wants to spend every day with you. There's a God who wants to know everything about you because he cares for you. Those are the two things you need to do. Are you doing them? In just a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation. It won't be long. Do whatever God's Spirit is speaking to you right now. Don't walk away numb. Don't do that because you know what you'd be doing? You'd be helping Satan whisper, check me. And it's not over. It's not. I don't know what struggles you've been going through. I don't know what problems. Hey, the king still has one more move. Why don't you turn to the king today and ask him for some help? God, we thank you that you are the master. We thank you that you are, uh, you are greater, greater than everything and anything. But we thank you most of all that you care for us. You care about our every need. Everything that matters to us matters to you. God, we thank you that prayer is, is something that can change our perspective. It may not change every circumstance, but it changes our perspective about who you are. So God, help us stop being beggars, asking for things. Help us to be servants of the King, understanding your desires. Help us to pray today, our Father in heaven. Help us to come to you with our greatest and deepest needs. Empty our hearts so we can conform to you. I pray that you'd be with your people today. Help us to make decisions we need to make. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a verse of invitation. It won't be long, so whatever you need to do, do it now as we sing. Light of the world, you step down.
Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for being here during this series that we've been in, uh, Life Hacks. Uh, uh, what a series, first of all, my favorite book in the Bible. Everybody knows that. Uh, but I have enjoyed this series and, and to end where we ended today with, with, as a Christian, one of the greatest life hacks that we have, uh, prayer. Uh, what a way to end it. Uh, looking forward to the next sermon series. I'll be up here next week uh, uh, with a simple title of uh, who you are uh, or who you think you are. And then we'll start another, another series right after that. What was I thinking? Uh, I'm looking forward to that. We'll be in Second Chronicles and that. But what was I thinking uh, will be that next sermon series that we'll be in. As far as announcements, I do have just a couple. First of all, school supplies. Now, we have a small amount of school supplies up here. What we're going to do, I'm actually going to have a box starting uh, next week up here that we're going to fill with school supplies. But here's the challenge uh, that I want to put in front of you for the school supplies. It's your school. That's it. That's your challenge. Make, take ownership of this ministry opportunity that we have to be able to give to our schools. This is my school. I want to bring in... Uh, stuff for my school. And I'll go ahead and tell you one thing that Heather did tell me that's not going to be on the list. You will have a list next week of, of helpful things. Uh, one thing that they're not asking for because they still have several leftovers, book bags. So that's a big ticket item that we can actually take off of that because they, because of our generosity in the past, they still have several book bags. But what goes in the book bags is where they're having their troubles with. So uh, that, that'll be a list that we'll have next week. We'll also have a box. So when you bring them in, if you don't want to bring them up here, grab one of the, the youth, one of the kids. Have them bring it up here for you. And we're just going to keep everything up here instead of putting it back there for the school supplies. Also, ladies, a couple announcements for you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, ladies' Bible study starts tomorrow uh, at 630. Uh, there is uh, still a sign-up sheet back there in the back. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, or if you have any questions about that, uh, see Miss Sandra, see, uh, uh, and she'll be able to give you the, the details and information about that. Also, Ladies for Christ has a meeting also this week, Wednesday, over at Miss Annette's. That's at 6 o'clock Wednesday, and they're asking for, again, something else that we could take ownership in uh, for our school. Uh, they're taking up snacks for the teachers. Uh, that's this Wednesday, so make sure, ladies, that you know about that. Uh, if you have any other questions about the ladies' ministry, hey, talk to Miss Sandra before you uh, before you leave, uh, uh, or, or give her a call uh, and ask her about those different opportunities you have. Also, guys, uh, we had men's breakfast this morning, so I'm sorry you missed out on breakfast this morning if you weren't here. Uh, but if you have questions about the men's ministry, hey, see Bob. Uh, let him uh, let him talk to you about some of the different opportunities, some of the ministry opportunities that we have coming up. Uh, as far as uh, other announcements, don't forget the, um, the food pantry items. Uh, make sure you continue to bring those items in. And as we get into a time of prayer now, and, and when we think about prayer, I do want to mention uh, uh, we, as a church, uh, took dinner over to Miss Wileen and the entire family last night. And so I was there, and she said, hey, are you going to church tomorrow? I was like, yeah, of course I am. And she said, will you take these flowers to the church in memory of David? Uh, so these are in memory of David up here, uh, if you're wondering about the flowers. Uh, uh, and with that said, I'd ask that you continue to pray for Miss Wileen. She is going through a time right now uh, that I can't even fathom to understand. Uh, uh, you know, with the passing of Brother Boone uh, and then also with Teresa and her health uh, it's, it's, it's really a rough time for her. So if you can lift her up in, in your prayers. And going back to the life hacks that, that Brother Bill was mentioning, I'll go ahead and give you a great uh, tool for that. It's the prayer guide back there in the back. He said, you know, one of the best things that you can do is actually write down your prayers. I encourage you. I, matter of fact, I don't encourage you. I challenge you to do that. Go ahead, if you don't have one yet, make sure you grab one before you leave. Write down your prayers. That way you have that in your hand. As you go through your quiet time each and every day, each and every week, uh, and, you can, and you can have that with you. Uh, that's why we do this. It also has a calendar in it. It has some other information in it. Great, useful things that you can use. Uh, use it. That's what it's there for. Uh, uh, but I would ask that you continue to pray for Wileen and that entire family as well. Uh, as far as uh, finishing up service today, as we always do with our worship and our tithes, our offerings uh, and, and that being our worship, I know I've used this verse. I, I don't know why, but I get fixated on a verse sometimes. Uh, and I, I just, 
the John 3.16, the example that Christ puts in front of us about giving and how he showed how much he loved us by the gift that he gave us. He, he showed us in a very practical, in a very real way by Christ going to the cross for us. Uh, and, and that's not just a nice story to tell people. That's, that's, that's a factual story that happened. You can read about it in non-biblical writings about the crucifixion. It's real. It's happened. That's a real, uh, a real example, a real illustration of how much God loves us. So what I'm going to tell you is how can we show God that we love him in a very practical way? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal uh, thunder from Bill. Take out your phone. That, that is a real uh, practical way that we can show God that we love him. How? If you go on your phone, and, and not all of y'all might not have this, but most of y'all have a calendar on your phones. What does your calendar look like? Are you, is, is your calendar filled up with God? And then also your accounts, uh, your bank accounts, uh, all of your different monies that you have that you probably have on your phone. Does that, does that uh, show Christ as well? Uh, so with that said, let's end in a word of prayer as we finish up today. And as we give, don't forget, you can drop your offering in the bucket as you leave. Uh, you can also go to Tithely uh, online, do it there, and keep track of it there. You can mail it in. Uh, and also prayer requests also, if you have those, you can drop them on the offering bucket as well. Uh, but with that said, let's end in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, Father, we thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for your grace. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you are in each one of our lives, dear Lord. And as fathers, we've gone through this sermon series of life hacks, dear Lord. Father, I pray that, that as we have read through the book of James, Father, that, that we can see our lives played out in the book of James, dear Lord. And Father, that we can use these life hacks in our own lives, just like today, Father, with prayer. One of the greatest life hacks that you have ever given us is a conversation with you. Father, may we see it as that, a conversation with our Father, an intimate conversation, a back-and-forth conversation, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for that. And, Father, as we leave out today, as we continue to celebrate and worship uh, with our offerings and our tithes and our giving, dear Lord, Father, I pray that everything, everything given, Father, Go, uh, goes to your kingdom, dear Lord. Father, that's the greatest part of our worship of you, Father, that, 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 that we're worshiping you even in our giving, dear Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing that for us. And Father, I ask that you be with us as we leave out today. Father, as we go down these steps today, dear Lord, Father, as we get in our vehicles, as we go about our ways, Father, may everything we say, everything we do, Father, shine your light. Points people to you, Father. Lead us and guide us in that. And again, Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.